Get a bitch in fall. Let's celebrate. Whoa. Let's celebrate. Let's go. Alright, so today we're gonna to be making two different cocktails, one from DCA and then one from Heaven's Door from Austin. Um, I'm going to be making a Vuvure. Uh, Vuvure is a classic cocktail uh, from the 1930s, 1980s, 1930s, yeah, 1930s. Um, I feel personally like it's a cocktail that a lot of people have forgotten about. I believe that it is the most balanced cocktail. And then what I'll be making is I'm today I'm going to pay a little homage to a very amazing woman and important person that I think in our industry, a young lady by the name of Ivy Nix at a bar in Brooklyn called Get Landa. It's uh, across the street from <clears throat> Clover Club. Uh, she actually just re wrote a new book uh, on Latin spirits. If you look it up, it's quite beautiful. She created a very beautiful riff on a New York sour from the 1880s. And it's called a Pan Am sour based off a critique from David Wondrich in the Imbibe book. She, uh, she kind of created this beautiful whiskey meets cachaça. Hi guys, welcome back. We are here with Deviant Cocktail Art. My name is Kaylin Gill. Um, I've been in the industry for 12 years. I uh, work at a cocktail craft place out here in Dallas. Uh, we are here with Austin Millsbach. He is with Heaven's Door. I started before Heaven's Door working in Dallas, Texas, uh, working for a couple bars, which is Standard Four, Boulevard Yay. Um, got to cut my teeth here in Dallas and kind of learn kind of that bare bones uh, classics and academic training in our bar industry. Uh, after leaving MIB uh, in London two years ago, I then transitioned over to the brand side and started with Heaven's Door. Um, it's kind of a brand that I fell in love with because of just the concept of who we are. And so talking about Heaven's Door, okay. cheers. We're going to start talking about actually the three brands that are essentially on our core line. We'll start with our Tennessee bourbon. When you talk about Heaven's Door, we all like to talk about the, the, what would you say, the elephant in the room, the celebrity. Yes, Bob Dylan is one of our investors. He is not a celebrity endorsement. He is actually one of our large investors. And without him, we wouldn't even be able to launch the brand. So thanks to him, we pay homage to him by having our the numerous gates on each bottle uh, that is celebrating his art, which recently was in Japan for an art exhibit. These pieces, when get sold at auction, all go to different charities, 100% of anything bought goes to a different charity of his choosing. So that's kind of our way of telling him thank you for letting us be who we are and create what we want to create. But then let's get into the juice itself. When you talk about our whiskey, we tend to think about master distillers like Dave Pickerel, God rest his soul. For us, we talk about Ryan Perry. Ryan Perry is the master blender and kind of genius behind what is Heaven's Door. So when you think about our brands, you think about our brands kind of in this hierarchical stance. So again, starting with the bourbon, we'll talk about a bourbon that is a high rye, non-Lincoln County. What that means is it is a non-charcoal filtered bourbon. Uh, when I say it's a high rye, it's higher than your traditional, and there is no wheat in our bourbon. So, so what's the, the difference between a bourbon and a rye? Because a lot of people don't know the difference. Well, so when, when you're talking about the difference between a bourbon and a rye, you're talking about with bourbons, you need at least a minimum of 51% mm -hmm. corn, you have to have at least a minimum of two years aged in a uh, virgin oak barrel. And then with, with ours, they're in a mash bill, kind of essentially the flavor formula of our juice. That's where we start talking about like what components make the juice. Yeah, so when you say a high rye, it means that there's a lot of rye, but not over 51%. But not over 51%, exactly. Um, so when you talk about ours, you kind of talk about it in terms of front, middle, and finish. I always like to say there's a tip, the tip of the tongue is a little bit of texture. And then you kind of start to, as you go to the back and, and middle, the small grain comes in. So essentially, when you're talking about bourbons, people tend to think that they're really viscous, they're very sweet. Um, a lot of that tends to do with the corn itself, but also with us not having any filtration in our cuts. Well, there's no wheat in there either. Exactly, and the there's wheat no wheat. Sweet. We, that, and, and adds a little bit of texture. Mm -hmm. So with ours, we want our small grain to kind of be the co-star in the juice. So rather than it be like a tertiary flavor, something on the very subtle back end, we want it to have a kind of Whole almost body. same platform as the, as the large grain or corn. Yeah. So that's kind of the concept of the unfiltered version of our bourbon. Then we kind of go into our double barrel. So our double barrel is essentially three whiskeys blended into four different barrels. The reason for this was we took our tasting panel, we all talked about whiskeys we liked 
whiskeys we didn't like and kind of not just saying, oh, I don't like it. Why don't you like it? Or I like it, but this fell short. And we kind of created this metric from it. And this is another thing that even Bob Dylan was a contributor to that tasting panel as well, having his, what his thoughts about whiskey. You all got together and like talked about what you liked in whiskeys, what you didn't like in whiskeys, like exactly. their tasting notes, where it fell short, where it excelled, and then you guys just kind of put these all together and came up with your own. Yeah, so Ryan Perry kind of took that metric and translated it into kind of what our bottle is. So essentially what he did is he took uh, two very high corn in Lincoln County, Tennessee whiskeys. He then put those into 12 year old uh, hand-picked bourbon barrels. Uh, so freshly dumped, essentially keeping the staves wet to continue the extraction Ooh. process. Ah, Left that in there for about six years. Then we took uh, our rye and our rye is a very high rye with just a little bit of barley. Um, we took our rye at about 10 to 12 percent, added it to that blend, almost very much grandmother style, hence why it's not specifically 10, it's not specifically yeah. 12, it's to taste. We then take that blend and we place it in a whole other new American oak barrel at a level four char for another year. So, we, so yes, what, that's how many, seven so, years, eight years? So you're, you're looking at seven to eight years on that juice in the bottle now. It was it started off at seven. I think we're closer to eight now yeah. since you have to use your youngest age to give it a statement. We actually don't put uh, ages age on our bottles for a reason. Um, whiskey never really had an age statement. When you're also kind of being more true to everybody. It seems exactly. like there's not a real age statement. It just has different age periods to exactly. it. Exactly. And yeah. these things create a profile. And it's, if you like the juice, drink it. Yep. I don't care what the age statement's on it. If you're chasing a number, nine times out of ten, you'll probably be disappointed because you're just looking for something yep. at a high year. And it might not be what you're used to drinking or what your palate No, enjoys. it could be a different cask or they could be using a different mash bill. Like, exactly. The number is just a number. How long it's been in a barrel. And that was and that was the whole point created in Canada. Canadians created the age statement because they assumed Americans would start chasing numbers. And lo and behold, the Canadians. Yeah, the <laughs> Canadians. I thought you Canadians. said it. it took me a minute. Yeah, Canadians. Um, so they that was actually a, a marketing ploy done in Canada for to create Americans chasing a number, which actually followed suit across the world. And that's why a lot of age statements are. Quite so did models. Scotch fall after that? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Scott, so, well, Scotch originally started as doing the blend. Yeah. They, they would blend it for consistency because at the time distillation knowledge wasn't very. I didn't strong. realize that Scotch started following that too. Mm -hmm. though. like. Yeah, a lot of people thought that like Scotland was the one that started creating. The yeah, that's what I thought. But I've actually, done not learned the Canadian. Yeah, it, was, thing. it was actually a Canadian thing, and then that and then Scotland learned. Oh, well, our stuff's older. That we can do that. We'll chase that. And, and they so do. That, and they do. And so and that's what they, and that's how that started. So we kind of took that little bit of tradition where they didn't have age statements and we're like, well, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to add it to our bottle because if you like the juice, you like the juice. And that's kind of what we hope. Well, if you again, don't you're like being it, more genuine. And yeah. that's, that to me resonates. I love when things are being very genuine. And like, like you said, you guys don't have age statements. Mm -hmm. Your juice is just your juice and it's delicious. And that's really shit all that matters. Right. And that's, and that's kind of what we're going for with it. Uh, let's jump to the rye. So when you, when you actually get into our rye, our, our rye has a little bit of uh, special nuances. As I said, you kind of have this like hierarchy when you're starting to talk about our whiskey. With our rye, it's a very high rye with a, just a small touch of barley. And so the reason for that, the reason why there's barley in all three of our mash bills, is that barley creates a natural enzyme that helps natural fermentation. So when you're going from fermentation to distillation, that barley helps that activated yeast kind of do what it needs to so that we can then create our beautiful distillate. So it's like giving a three-year-old sugar. Exactly. And it's, it's 100% <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, but then with ours, we wanted to, we've noticed a lot of people tend to be polarized on guys. It's starting to finally gain kind of passion for it once again. Is it because it they have there. this weird thought process that rye is super spicy and hot? Exactly. And they think they think it's too boozy. They think it's dry. The, yeah. the connotation of spice turns people off and it's kind of one of those if it's you don't know what it is, place. you should just try it. Yeah, and, and try, and try different ones because they all right. have their own Nashville. They all have their own flavor profiles and, and they're all beautiful. And essentially back when rye was uh, first originally popular, ryes were sweeter. Yep. Because their, their mash bills were, had a couple other things in them that kind of added kind of a sweetness to it. As were newer ryes now tend to have a little bit of dill notes, dry spice tones. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying dry is like you're gonna dry your mouth out. No, it just like like spice dry, like yeah, baking spice dry. Exactly. And so with ours, we noticed we started carrying this tone. We wanted to give a polite finish. 
So what we actually did is we got, we created staves in the south of France, in the Vosges region. Mm -hmm. We let them air dry. So French wood tends to be really tight fibers. And, uh, and the, the concept of letting them air dry for three years, it also kind of like adds cracks in those fibers. I personally love French wood. That's my favorite to like drink. So I had some of your rye earlier today. And I was like, this kind of has like a carrot, you know? And I like looked at the back and I was reading it. And I was like, oh, mountains in French. Okay, exactly. That, um, it's like that all that right. vernacular soaked into yep. the wood. And so we built a different barrel than what most people are used to seeing. So your traditional barrel is about 52 gallons. The really short fat guys that mm -hmm. everyone sees that you see in every picture everywhere. Yeah. So ours are 55 gallons and they're called a cigar barrel. Not because of tobacco or smoke, but because it's really tall and slender. I mean, it almost goes past my waist on height because they're that tall and they're that skinny. And the, pro and the concept is that we finish them in that because there's more surface area to wood. Yep. And that gives us a better finish and a stronger finish. And that's why you notice- So it's kind of like saying. a pressure cooker, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. That's the whole, yeah, exactly. And what that does is it gives a politer finish. So you'll get this kind of texture in the front from your rye. It'll start to kind of cascade and then it's dry, nice spice. And then you get this almost it's kind of vegetal towards the end, yeah. Vegetal thin. It's like it's really nice. It's like sweet vegetable finish yes. on the back end, sure. and it exactly. Yeah. And then so you just kind of makes your salivary glands. And like that sounds super whistle. weird when I say carrots. I don't mean like you're gonna taste carrots, but for like people who taste whiskey and they know what they're looking for, you're gonna have that distinct, almost clean with a little bit of sweetness at the back end of your rye. It's exactly what you say. It's from the mountains and it's. And it's a little bit of a trick as well. So good. A little bit of a trick as well because it kind of makes you want to have another sip. Yeah. As where some rise, you'll kind of get that dry and on the back end. You, and you wait for and a little bit. Out of it. Yeah. And so that, so it's a little bit of a ploy, but we like it. We like it mainly because of the flavor. But That's it's gonna work great in cocktails too. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. you're gonna have that that like that part that you're talking about that makes people want to drink. You can make that come out more in cocktails too. Oh, and it's 100%. great. It's so much fun. Without question. If anyone's curious about knowing your whiskey without just looking up kind of what this brand, what this brand or whatever other brands you're curious about are, one of my favorite books to grab is Bourbon Empire. This is a great history on whiskey. It's a not too thick like a lot of the other ones are. It's really concise and very beautiful. Essentially, Drew Garrison, a good friend of mine, always says, when you're trying to learn about whiskey, read a history book. When you're trying to learn about history, uh, look up what whiskey, where whiskey's been and what it's done. And essentially they kind of go very hand in foot. Have you ever had anybody tell you that when you're trying something not to read on it before you try it? Because oh, I, yeah. I know when I bartend and I make cocktails, you I, tell, I don't tell them anything. They're like, oh, what's in this? And I'm like, try it first. Oh, exactly. This is, this is the name of my Always. game, try it first. Tell me what you think and then I'll tell you what's in it. Without question. Because I then think... you don't think about what's in it already. Yeah, the suggestivism is a real thing. Yep. And when you tell someone this and this and this is gonna be in it, that's all they're going to taste. They're not going to look into like deeper notes and nope. they might lose something that they might really appreciate out, about it. And also if you try something for the first time, try it like four or five times. Yeah. That's when you get the best assessment that's, of like where, where you, where you are, if you like it or don't. That's one of my mottos is I'll try everything twice, sometimes three times, because it could have been an off day. You might have eaten something earlier in the day exactly. that destroyed your palate. You might not be in the mood. Like, Really just depends on how so you are that day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Ate something greasy, ate something spicy. Yep, had it's something big, super big. clean and fresh, and then you go to something that's super big and bold, but it's gonna be really big and bold. I think a lot of people forget that when they're trying to sing. Oh, you have yeah. to remember what you've eaten. 100%. Or drank, or smoked, or whatever. Like, what you've done throughout that day is going to affect the way things taste. Try it again. And then try it again. And then again. And then again. again. <laughs> try it neat. Try it on a try different day, exactly. try different days of the week. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you want to get into making some cocktails? Yeah, let's make some drinks. Perfect. I'm excited. Me too. Cheers. Cheers. Hi, guys. We are going to be making a bouquet, which is a classic cocktail made in the 1930s. It is a cocktail that I think that has been forgotten about. And so we're going to bring it back and teach you how to make it. It's the most balanced cocktail, in my personal opinion. Uh, we're going to be using Heaven's Door Rye, Benedictine, Sweet Vermouth, and cognac. So we're gonna go ahead and grab our sweet meat. So we're gonna grab our mixing glass and our belt jigger. We're gonna do three quarter ounces of sweet vermouth. A quarter ounce of Benedictine. Now, if you know how to do a bar spoon, I would do a bar spoon, but for consistency purposes, I'm gonna tell you to use a quarter ounce. Three quarter ounces of cognac. 
Any VSOP cognac will work perfectly in a group Our Heaven's Door straight rye in three quarter ounce. And then we're going to use Nashad bitters and Angostura bitters, two dashes of each. Make sure that you dilute your cocktail appropriately, otherwise you're going to lose out on the balance that comes from this cocktail. It's about 30 to 45 rotations. I'm going to grab our rocks glass and our julep strainer. You can use a Hawthorne strainer if you don't have a julep. Then we're going to put a large cube in. So a large cube dilutes a little bit slower, so you're going to have more of that flavor come out. And use a bar spoon when you put it in, that way it doesn't splash up on you. And then we're going to zest a lemon right over the top. Give it a nice swirl right over the edge. And you, we have a bouquet. Hi guys, my name is Austin Millsball with Heaven's Door. Today I'm going to be going over a variation on a, a modern classic cocktail in the 1880s called the New York Sour. This variation was created by a bartender by the name of Ivy Mix at a bar in Brooklyn called La Inda. This is her aptly named Pan Am Sour, and this is a her variation on that New York Sour, and I think then thus named by David Wondrich, our very famous cocktail historian. So let's get started. So we're gonna start from our citrus to the last spirit, which would be our Heaven's Door. This is more of a technique that bartenders would be using not at home. It's kind of more of like a behind the bar kind of thing. Um, so bear with me on that. We'll also be using a jigger. So this, you can use this or try to learn a free pour method. A good rule of thumb for a free pour method is about every second is a half ounce. And now that will vary with everyone's count as well. So just know it's a decent rule of thumb. With your jigger, this is gonna be your standard unit of measurement. You're gonna start with your two ounce, your one ounce, and then with this Leopold bell jigger, it'll have delineated lines below. They do everything from a quarter, a half, three quarter, one, one and a half, two ounces. So that'll kind of give you some form of standardization when you're doing the string. We're gonna start with our orange juice. It's freshly squeezed orange juice. So when you're actually doing your fresh squeeze, make sure to straighten out your pulp. Also, when you're doing your orange juice, it's ready to go right after you juice it. As well with lemon juice, it's about six hours after it's freshly squeezed. That's kind of great to the American palate. Lime juice is about four hours. Just kind of things to think about. We'll start with the OJ. As I said, we'll use a quarter ounce. That'll be the bottom line in your bell jigger. We got a little bit of simple syrup to this drink. It'll actually be a three quarter ounce. We'll be adding cachaca, which is a new addition to what the New York Sour originally is at three quarters ounce. We'll be using Hero, which obviously is Heaven's Door bourbon. It'll be an ounce and a half. We're gonna be building the drink, then adding ice. This is going to help so that your drink doesn't get over diluted. This is at home, you can touch your ice. It's just a better practice to do. We're going to shake with our large tin away from you, your small tin towards you at a 45 degree angle to lock in your juice. When you're shaking your drink, make sure to go back and forth. You can go as you want. What you want to do is you want to wait till there's a little bit of a frost on your glass. That's your, that's your tin telling you your cocktail's ready. We're using our Hawthorne strainer to strain out our cocktail. Now what we're going to do, this is a very interesting technique. We're going to be layering a Malbec over the top.
and that will be your Pan Am salad. Get a bitch in fall. Whoa, let's celebrate. Whoa, let's celebrate. Let's